You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. Your next stop. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. James Ofer here with you, and we're glad that you are with us tonight. Ready for another study from God's Word. We're going to be doing a little review tonight of a... Uh, some things, uh, a product, we'll just say a product of individuals who aren't really careful about what the Bible says. Now, you might say, well, James, that's kind of broad. Well, what we're going to do tonight, friends, is we're going to be looking at how far people go when they don't practice what they preach. We'll just say it that way. When people don't practice what they preach, anything goes. And that's what we're going to show you tonight. <clears throat> but first, I want to give you our content information. Here's how you can reach me at 276-340-2653, wordmanlord at gmail.com. And that's uh, how you can reach me any time if you'd like to study the Bible or need want to copy this program or you want some more information about something that we've said or you want to know more about the church we're about in the Bible, the Church of Christ. Just give me a call. we we'll would be glad to sit down and talk with you and visit with you and uh, do what we can to help you understand what the will of the Lord is. Ephesians 5, verse 17. So uh, please uh, take advantage of, of uh, our availability. You know, oftentimes people don't want to talk about the Bible. They don't want to study the Bible. And uh, when uh, you find individuals that are willing to study the Bible, they're willing to open up, the God, open up God's Word and let's see what, what thus said the Lord is, then uh, I, if you're that kind of person, we are that kind of person, that, that kind of people. So we want to meet you and visit with you. We'd be glad to study the Bible with you uh, as long and as often as we can. So we hope that you'll take advantage of that, uh, that very uh, thing. <clears throat> so tonight, friends, what we're going to start off with, we want to start off with this idea of being selective hearers or selective understanding. You know, I, I think oftentimes husbands are usually accused of this, you know. They only hear certain things. They only hear what they want to hear when the wife's talking. But that's really how people are when it comes to the Bible as well. They're very selective in how they hear or what they hear. For example, notice in Matthew chapter 13, Matthew chapter 13 in verse, uh, beginning in verse 13, I want you to listen to what Jesus said about parables. They asked him why he spake in parables. And he said, Therefore, speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand. And seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and they should be converted, and I should heal them. And so it wasn't like they couldn't hear Jesus. They just didn't want to understand the meaning, or they didn't want to accept the conclusion of his teaching, you might say. And that's what we have, friends. Selective hearing, selective understanding, or just really listening to some things of truth and only accepting that. Now, think about this. When you hear truth, you may say, I, I like that, but there may be another time when you hear truth and you say, I don't like that. And the result is, you only take part of it. You're, you're very selective in your, in your hearing or choosing what you understand or choosing what you believe. And that's very, very dangerous. It's not profitable. As a matter of fact, listen to what Paul said. In Acts 20, in verse 20, Acts 20, and verse 20, <clears throat> Paul says, I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. Now, he's talking to the, the uh, elders from Ephesus. And he says, I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying uh, both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, come on down to about verse 27 here. Notice what he says. He says, Wherefore I take... Uh, Verse 26, I take uh, you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. So he says, I didn't keep back anything that was profitable to you, 
and I gave you all the counsel of God, the whole counsel of God. So the whole counsel of God is what is profitable for you. That's what's beneficial to you. Now, if you're only hearing a little bit of it, that's really not going to help you. If you only hear a little bit of something that's profitable, that's not really going to help you in the long run. I mean, if you went to the doctor and the doctor says, okay, you need to take these three medicines, and all you hear him say is one. You need to take these, th this one medicine, but he's got two more he wants to give you. But you only take the one. That's really not going to help you. As a matter of fact, it might even hurt you. See, it may be that you need all three of those medicines together to really get the full benefit. But taking one may be harmful to you. And so all the counsel of God or the whole counsel of God, the whole truth, is what's really going to help people. That's why Jesus said, sanctify them with thy truth. Thy word is truth, John 17, 17. You need all of God's word <clears throat> in order to have all of God's truth. Now, everything that's been revealed to us, friends, is for our benefit. It's for our learning. Peter says that we, we've been given all things that pertain to life and godliness. And so if we, if we neglect part of it, or we only select part of it, then we're really not helping ourselves. Now, that's where, that's where uh, we're getting in our lesson tonight. That's what we're talking about. Because tonight, what I want to do is I want to demonstrate to you what happens when only partial truth is followed, or when only partial truth is heard and listened to and observed. And I know only partial truth is what is, what is being taught or is what is being uh, followed because I listened to what the preacher said. Now, tonight, this is going to be a review of the Cornerstone Nashville, the Cornerstone Church in Nashville. It's just called Cornerstone. Cornerstone Nashville. And the, this is a, a, I don't know what uh, really denomination they are. It's really hard to tell because no one wants to call names anymore. They don't want to call themselves a name or identify themselves a name. But I, I don't know if they're Pentecostal or Baptist or Baptocostal or Captist, Catholic, Baptist, Captist. I don't know what they are. But, but notice, notice what happens. And I submit to you that what we're going to see tonight is a product of only uh, hearing certain things that you want to hear, having selective understanding or selective hearing when it comes to God's Word. Now, the occasion, let me just set the occasion for you. The occasion of this <clears throat> is uh, the weekend leading up to the 4th of July. The church had a rodeo. That's right, a rodeo. And everybody was dressed up in their, <clears throat> you know, their finest Western apparel, I guess you might say. I don't know. I guess they went down to the Western store and bought them all a Western shirt. They probably didn't wear one every, uh, the rest of the year at all. But I want you to listen to what the preacher says here. And then we're going to just kind of uh, listen and make some observations about the, uh, uh, about the statements that he made to show you uh, what we're talking about here. Because when we're dealing with this lesson, when we're, when we're listening to what he says, uh, it's evident that he's not really giving you the whole truth. He's not really giving the whole truth to the people listening and that he's not following the whole truth. First of all, I want you to listen for this phrase. The truth you know. The truth you know. So let's, get, let's listen to uh, what it says. His name is Mari uh, Davis. He's, going, he's, he's the preacher, senior pastor. <clears throat> but listen to what he says, and he's talking about the truth you know. Nobody needs to change their life. Nobody needs to surrender themselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And you can identify yourself based on your sin nature and your Christianity. And that's not true. You cannot minimize God's grace, but there are things grace does not do. God's love is an amazing gift that God has in his heart for us. And yet without grace, love is not communicated. Love won't do what grace will do. Grace won't do what love will do. And if you don't understand God's love and you don't understand God's grace, you're limiting yourself in your experience with God. But let me tell you a truth that you're not hearing in America today. Grace will not produce freedom in your life. 
Grace will produce forgiveness, but not freedom. There he comes. Love will not produce freedom in your life. Love is not the complete answer to everything except in the fact that God himself is love and everything God gives comes from a heart of love. Jesus said this, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. It's not truth that sets you free, it's only the truth you know that sets you free. And that word know means you have an intimate, interactive relationship with it, which really means you're doing the truth, you're obeying the word, you're doing and acting out the word of God you know. Now, stop right there. Now listen, friends. See, now that may sound all well and good, but listen to what he says. The truth that you know, the truth that you know, doing the truth that you know. Well, what truth do you know? And how much of the truth do you need to know? And how much of the truth can you not know and still be okay? See, what if you only know part of the truth? I mean, is that, is that enough? Is that essential? Is that profitable to only know part of the truth, the truth that you know? And he says that means the truth that you're doing. But is it, is it just enough to know that Jesus is the Son of God? Is that enough truth? Is, is that enough truth to know? See, see, friends, this is what we're talking about. When you hear someone say things like this, you say, wait a minute. What do you mean the truth that you know? What does that mean? All right? Is that enough truth to know that Jesus is the Son of God? Now, Billy Graham, which I heard Micah talking about Billy Graham, Billy Graham will say, you don't even know, have to know that. Billy Graham says there are people who are going to be in heaven who don't even know Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and they're going to be in heaven. Well, say, Billy Graham doesn't, doesn't even believe that. Billy Graham says you don't even have to know the truth to be set free. But Mr. Davis says, well, it's the truth that you know. Well, look at this. In John 12 and verse 42... John 12, in verse 42, listen to what the Bible says. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. Was, was that enough? Was it enough just to know that Jesus was the Son of God or to believe that he was the Son of God? But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him lest they, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Well, was it enough? Was it enough to believe on Jesus Christ, but yet not to confess him? See, the truth that you know and the truth that you do. Now, they knew that Jesus was the Son of God. They believed on him. But they didn't do it. But they didn't act upon it. Well, was that enough? See, what if you know some truth, but you don't do that truth? Then you're not going to be free. But if you only know certain truth and you're doing certain truth, and you don't know the rest, is that enough? See, friends, here's the danger. The danger is saying, well, you only have to know certain things about truth in order to, to be okay. Well, James tells us in James 2, verse 19, James chapter 2 and verse 19, tells us that thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But thou wilt know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. Do you know that? Now, Mr. Mr. Maury, that's what he said. He said, well, it's, it's, the, it's the truth that you do. That's important. Okay. I agree it's important to do the truth. But is it enough just to do what you know? Or is it important that you know all the truth, the whole counsel of God? Or do you only need to know certain things? See, what about this? What is it? What is it enough to know just about baptism? You know, I find it interesting that when we're talking to individuals about what you must do to be saved, they always will tell you the partial truth that they know. Oh, I know you got to believe Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Yeah, you got to believe. The Bible says you got to believe. And I said, well, I know you've got to repent, because everybody knows that Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, uh, if you if, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. You know, I, 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 we know that you got to repent. Now, if they know that Jesus is the Son of God and they believe on Him, is that enough? What if that's all they know? What if all they knew was Jesus is the Son of God? Is that enough to know? Well, somebody said, no, you, you need to know some repent too. Yeah, you got to repent. Acts 17 to verse 30. Paul commanded all men everywhere to repent. 
Yeah, that's right. That's right. See, now now you know this. Look, the times of ignorance God winked at. You need you need to know that God commands you to repent. You can't be ignorant about it. Now, if you know God says repent and you don't do it, is that okay? That's all you know. Now, the Bible says you have to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, too. You've got to confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. As they went on their way, Philip and the eunuch came to a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest in thy heart, with all thine heart thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now that was that was essential. And as a matter of fact, Philip needed to know that the eunuch knew that bit of truth. It wasn't enough to know that truth, but it was truth that you also had to say. It was truth that you had to confess. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So it's not just a truth you know, friends. It's the truth that... It's all the truth that you know and obey. Because the eunuch knew, hey, I need to be baptized. Is there anything that I don't know? Is there any truth that I don't know that I need to know in order to obey the Lord in being baptized? And Philip said, yeah, you, you need to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And when the eunuch knew that, when he understood that and knew that, and then did it, then he was ready to be baptized for the remission of sins. Now, is it enough just to know that you need to be baptized? I find it interesting how many times people will say, well, baptism is not essential to salvation, but yet you have to be baptized in order to obey God. That doesn't make any kind of sense, friends. To say that you have to be baptized to obey God, but you don't have to be baptized in order to be saved. But you have to be obedient to God to be saved. How can you be obedient to God and receive salvation and yet not be baptized if God says be, be baptized? How is it that someone can say, well, I'm going to obey the Lord in baptism, but it's not for remission of sins. But yet I can be saved if I don't obey the Lord in baptism. How can you be saved if you don't disobey God? How can you be saved if you disobey God? So, but it's not enough, friends, just to say, well, I've been baptized. You know, I've been baptized. I've been baptized. Is that, is that enough? Is it enough to know that you need to be immersed in water? Is that enough? Look at this. In Acts 19, Acts 19, uh, beginning in verse 1, and it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, uh, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples there, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether it be Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? Wait a minute. Let's stop there for a minute. Did you catch this, friends? Paul said, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And then, when they said no, he said, Unto what then were you baptized? You know what Paul understood? Paul understood that if you believed, you were going to be baptized. Don't tell me, someone said, well, I believe, I believe, and therefore I'm saved, and then I was baptized. No, Paul said, if you believed, you would be baptized. He joined them together in the sense of, if you truly believed, you would be baptized. Under what were you baptized? And they sent him to John's baptism. Now, here's my point, friends. Here's my point. Was it enough for them to know that they needed to be baptized? Because obviously someone had told them they needed to be baptized. Apollos had come through apparently and told them they needed to be baptized. We read in the previous chapter, Apollos knew only the baptism of John. And they said, well, we were baptized under John's baptism. Now, they had been taught baptism. But, and that was the truth that they knew. And let me tell you, John's baptism was truth. It was certainly sanctioned by God and authorized by God for a period of time. But Paul said, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on 
Him who should come after him that is on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now was it enough for them to know a truth that they needed to be baptized? Or was it essential that they understand that baptism that baptism was for a specific purpose, a certain purpose, now that Christ had died, now that Christ had come. You see, friends, it wasn't enough just to know a little bit of the truth, and it wasn't enough to know just to act upon a little bit of the truth. It wasn't just a truth that they knew. They needed to know all the truth. So when I hear a preacher say, well, you know, we need a little truth. You just need to obey the truth that you know. Friends, that's dangerous. That's dangerous because some people know a little bit of truth and man, they did, they run with it. Some people pick up the Bible. See? Some people pick up the Bible and they'll open it up and they'll, and they'll, they'll find a little bit of truth. All of God's Word is truth. And they don't understand it. They don't know it. A man called in just a few weeks ago. I remember. Maybe a little longer than that. Months ago. And was talking about how well the Bible says if, if your hand offends you, cut it off. Now, friends, that's dangerous to know that little bit of truth in, in God's Word and run with it. And that's the same thing people do. They, they open up the Bible and they go, well, you know, John 3, 16, yeah, God so loved the world. He gave His only begotten Son. Whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but they bear in life. Period. That's all you need to do. That's dangerous, friends. Is that true? John 3, 16 is truth all day. But it's not all the truth. See that? It's not the whole truth. It's only partial truth. So if you're, if you're one of those individuals that are doing selective hearing, selective understanding, you're going, you're going to be in trouble. You're going to be in trouble. So, so that, that's a dangerous thing for a man to say, well, it's the truth that you know. It's the truth that you, that you uh, know and believe and, and the truth that you do. Now, let's, let's continue listening to what he says. I'm going to skip uh, forward just a hair here. And uh, now listen to what he says. And the truth you embrace that you know is what sets you free. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 28, out of the truth, the Bible says, do not move the ancient boundary which your fathers have set. Don't do that. If the fathers set the boundary, don't move it. All of us remember in our teenage years, we're pushing against dad's boundaries and the consequences of pushing against dad's boundaries were always negative. Father really did know best. Most people don't understand God set boundaries for this country. Christopher Columbus wrote in the journals of Christopher Columbus that the spirit of the Lord came over me and, illuminated, and wonderfully illuminated my mind to discover the new world. I know it was the Holy Spirit that led me. The pilgrim... Now friends, that... That's pretty dangerous right there. You know, well, Christopher Columbus said that God God illuminated him or guided him to, into, to discover the new world. Friends, see how dangerous that is? That's the same thing people do today. Well, God led me, God told me. Friends, the only way God leads, guides, and directs people today is through his word. And nowhere in the word did it tell Christopher Columbus to go find a new, a new America, a new land. New country, new world. It didn't do it. That's just going to all the world to preach the gospel. Now, as you're going, you find some uncharted uh, land where no one's ever been before that you know of. Well, that may be fine, well, and good. God doesn't tell you to go discover new lands. God tells you to go into all the world to preach the gospel. But listen to what he said. God set boundaries and don't push the boundaries. Now that's a good principle, he, and he's going to talk a little bit more about that, uh, and he has to actually has some good things to say uh, on those lines, but I want to skip forward to uh, <clears throat> what he says about that. Let's see if I can find it right here. Have you ever heard, so I don't want religion, I just want relationship with Jesus. That's just a stupid statement. Do you know what the word religion means? The word re religion means knowledge of God. 
Who says I don't want knowledge of God? When you say I don't want religion, you're saying I don't want to know anything about God. You're perpetuating purposeful ignorance in your own life. And I don't want to be a religious person. Well, what does the word religious mean? It means I practice my knowledge of God. So you're looking at a man that is pursuing religion. Knowledge of God. And you're looking at a man that wants to be known as a religious man. I practiced what I preached. Now, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. Now, that's, that's pretty good, friends. Remember, we're talking about knowing, doing what you know, doing truth that you know. But did you notice this, friends? If you only know certain things, all right, if you only know, know certain things, then is it not the case then that you should not have to worry about how much you know? You know, you're only doing what you know? Isn't that the case? I mean, the man sa he says, well, the man says, I, I'm just going to do what I know. I'm going to practice what I know. Well, listen. Listen. If you only do what you know, isn't that enough? I mean, why would you need to learn some more? I mean, he's telling people, yeah, you need to, you, you should need to know about God. Religion is knowing about God. You need to know more about God. Why don't you know about more about God? If I just know there's a God, isn't that enough truth to know? The truth that I know, isn't that enough? And then talk about practicing what you know. Friends, I, I get all the time. Well, y'all don't believe in works salvation. Well, that sounds like doing something to me. Sounds like the man just told us that we're supposed to be doing something. You do what you know. I thought you weren't supposed to do this work salvation stuff. See how confusing it is? When you only know partial things, when you only know a few things, it's very dangerous because you start mixing up the whole council. And you're getting misinformation because, you, well, on one time I need to do this over here, but I'm not supposed to do it over here. The Bible says don't judge. The Bible says don't judge. And they don't start to read, they don't stop and read where the Bible says to judge. Oh, you need to know the Bible, you need to know God, but you only need to do what you know. See how dangerous this is, friend? Partial, partial knowledge is very dangerous. Now I want to get on to what he says here. Uh And without a knowledge of God and a practice of that, morality ceases to exist. And I know this is just not popular. But can I tell you the Bible has set the boundaries for morality? And they're absolute and they're non-negotiable. And no matter how confused we get, God's not confused of what's right and wrong. Now, did you catch that, friends? This is very important. This is our next point. The boundaries of morality are absolute. That's what he said. The boundaries of morality are absolute. It's quiet in here. The Bible has a statement in the New Testament. You know, the grace book. Act like men. Do you know God has an expectation of how men ought to act? You, there, it's not like we get to say, well, I'm this kind of man, I'm that kind of man. No, you just need to be a God man, and a God man is not confused about whether or not he is a man. You need to know what God made you to be. Oh, now that got some applause. You know what, friends? I agree with you. I agree with him on those points. He's exactly right. God set absolute boundaries on morality. And when people... When people push those boundaries, that's when all kinds of problems start. He, he knows it. He recognizes it. It's true. When people start pushing the boundaries and go beyond what God said, you get all kinds of problems with morality. He's exactly right. Absolutely right. 110% right. If I were there, I'd have said amen. I wouldn't have been clapping. I'd just, I'd just said amen. I don't know. I might have been clapping. It's, it's a rodeo. I don't know how, how they told the difference. But anyway, but uh, let, let's listen a little more to what he says here. 
And the Bible talks about how ladies ought to act. Well, I don't want some man to talk. Stop. Don't nobody care what we think. God said do it. God said be that. Our attitude is either yes sir or no sir. He's either Lord of all or he's not Lord of anything. And there's no confession of Jesus as Savior. You confess him as Lord, which means I put you in charge of my life. The problem in America is not our government. It's immorality. It's the decaying of the character of people. The tolerance of things that will destroy families, health. Vanderbilt just did an incredible... All right. <clears throat> now, again, I, I want to stress, he talked about absolutes on morality. And if God says do it, you just do it. You just do it. Now, that's right. Now, this is why I'm talking about selective hearing and selective understanding. Because I, you probably know where I'm going with this. Here's a man that's talking about absolutes on morality, absolute, absolute truths, absolute boundaries. Then if God says, if God says do it, then we should do it. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Are we getting audio on there, by the way? Matt? Is audio coming through? Yeah. Okay. All right, so, so he says let's do it. He says let's do it. Uh, if God said do it, we need to do it. Now, I want to skip down just a little bit to another point here. And let's see. That's the devil at work. John Quincy Adams said the highest glory of the revolution was this. It connected into one indissoluble bond. The principles of civil government and Christianity. Our law colleges, Harvard, and, and, and I say, tell you something. The problem is not out there. The problem is in here. It's in our churches. They never dreamed that we'd become so mentally inept and so character, characterly deformed that our country would be morphed into something God never did. And until we set the foundation back where it belongs, it's not going to be what it ought to be. And let me tell you something. The problem is not out there. The problem is in here. Listen right here. It's in our churches. Listen. Because our churches will not preach the truth and the Christians in the church will not be willing to listen to the truth. If you say that, I'm leaving. If you say that, I'm leaving. If you say that, I'm leaving. Well, you know, if it's in the Bible and you don't like it, you just need to get over yourself. Amen. Yeah, you do. Amen. You just need to get over yourself. Now, now friends, this is where we're going to make some application here. Listen again. Let me remind you what he said. Absolute boundary. Absolute boundaries on on morality. Absolute boundaries on on uh, what God says. Now, there's no doubt that God has set boundaries, and His Word sets boundaries on behavior, on how we view certain things or do certain things. Listen, in First Corinthians four, First Corinthians. Chapter 4 and verse 6. Listen to what Paul says. Paul said, And these things, brethren, have I in figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written. You don't, you don't put a man above what God says. You don't go beyond what is written. Now that, that's a true statement right there, friends. That's a, that's a boundary. And so, what Mr. Mari was talking about is exactly, exactly right. Individuals try to push the boundary, they go beyond what God said. And when they do it on morality, things like on, on moral issues, it really messes up our society. And then he talked about in the, in the churches. In the churches, people, they, uh, they don't like things, they get all upset, so they're just going to take their you know, candy and go home, or whatever, their money and go home, or whatever they want to take and go home, because they don't want to do it. And he says, you should get over yourself. If the Bible says do it, do it. Now, wait a minute. I, I, thought, I thought there was this thing called 
Well, he didn't say not to. You see, I wonder if I asked Mr. Uh, Mari Davis about some of the things that go on in Cornerstone Church in Nashville where he's the senior pastor. I wonder if I would get, well, he didn't say not to. Remember, God's word is absolute. It has some absolute boundaries. And if it's not in the Bible, you just need to get over it. Well, friends, if that's the case, see, then why is it that so many things are going on there in the Cornerstone Church and they don't recognize that they've actually pushed the boundaries? They've actually gone over the boundaries. They've actually gone way past the boundaries on what God said. Listen to this, for example. What about on things like salvation? Where is the sinner's prayer? Listen to what Mr. Uh, Davis, Mario Davis is going to say uh, about at the end of his little sermon at here. We'll call it a sermon at. Uh, that's about what it was. They stopped the bull riding so he could speak. But let's listen to what he says here. Changed is my mind lined up with the will of God. And you may be here today and you say, man, if God doesn't take my past off the table I don't have any hope for a future the shame, the guilt, the pain the failure, the stigma whatever it may be I want to give you a chance to pray with me this morning I want you to bow every head in this place every head, nobody moving and I'm going to ask a very simple question if you're here today and you say Mari I'm saved I'm born again I know Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior Pray for me. I don't need any prayer today. I'm going to heaven. Just let me know. If you don't have any doubt in your mind, raise your hand up real high. Now, where is this in the Bible? You know? If it was in the Bible, I'd get over it. I wouldn't have a problem with this if it was in the Bible. Friends, this is nowhere in the Bible. <laughs> this is not in the Bible, telling people to bow their head and raise their hand. Put your hands down real quick going to do this quick. If you're here and you say, Preacher, I couldn't raise my hand, but I need to get right with God and I need some things to change in my life and I, I need supernatural help. I need God to come into my life. And you may be where I was when I looked at the ceiling and said, God, if you're up there, come down here and prove yourself to me and if you do that, I'll serve you for the rest of my life. Now, friend, let me ask you this. The psalmist said in Psalm 8, in about verse 4, what is Man that thou art mindful of him. Man is a created being by God Almighty. Where does the creation man have the audacity to do what Mr. Mari just said he did? Demand that God come down here. God, you come down here and prove yourself to me and I'll serve you. Is that how it works? That is so haughty and high-minded and conceited and arrogant. God, come down here and, and prove yourself to me. Let me tell you something, friends. All these people that say, I'm going to ask Jesus to come into my heart. Jesus, forgive my sin. Jesus, do this. Jesus, do that. You need to get over yourself. God has already done His part. God's will of the world that He gave his only begotten son is the verse everybody likes to quote God sent his son to die on the cross for our sins that whosoever will believe on him and obey him Hebrews 5 9 he became their author of salvation to all the will obey him now if you will do his will then the blood of Christ will cleanse you who do you think you are telling God to do something God's already done all that he can do. God's already done more than he was required to do or needed to do. And here you are demanding one more thing. Lord, come into my heart. Come down here and prove yourself. Mr. Davis needs to get over himself. There is no such thing in the Bible as a sinner's prayer. As a sinner's prayer. And that's why... When people say that, listen, 
And when people say that, we say, well, you need to find it in the Bible. In John 9, verse 31, we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Now, where in, the, where in the Bible do you get that? It's not in the Bible. You need to get over yourself there, Mr. Mr. Davis. I understand not knowing who God is. If you'll give him a chance, I promise you, he'll do things you can't imagine. If you'd let me pray with you this morning, just slip your hand up right. Now, wait a minute. If you know who God is, though, isn't that enough? Let's go back to where we started. If you know who God is, isn't that plenty? Why do I need to raise my hand and ask Jesus to do anything for me? It's just the truth that I know. That's all. I, that's it's important, right? If I can just look at the creation and the and the Bible says in Psalm nineteen verse one, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament show forth His handiwork. When I look out and I see the the worlds that God created, I know that there's a supernatural being. I know there's some there's a power bigger than myself. I know there's a God. Isn't that enough? I mean, if that's the that's the that's the truth that I know, isn't that enough? See how dangerous it is? Because when you only give people part of the truth, are you are you only believing or you're only following part of the truth? You're being selective in the truth that you're following. It's dangerous. Because then you don't tell people what they need to hear and you yourself don't do it. Here's a man that's going to lead people in a sinner's prayer. Where you are. Raise it up. You couldn't raise thank you. Hold them up real high. Thank you. Thank you. All over the place. Hold your hands up real high. Hold your That's hands. good. Hold your hands. Your hands are up. Look at me. We're looking at each other. Stand up. Just stand up right there. Stand up right there. Just stand up. You're good. Just stand up. Stand up. I'm going to lead you in a very simple prayer. The usher is going to put a packet in your hands when we're done. Church, I want you to pray this all together as these people make a commitment or a rededication of their life to Jesus. And I want you to follow him all the days of your life. Say it with me. Dear Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I ask forgiveness. Now friends, we're talking about people who are outside the body of Christ, according to him. Don't know God, and this is what they're praying. In Acts 16, when the jailer asked, what must I do to be saved? The Bible says, they said, believe God. On the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be, and thou, uh, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Well, the Philippian jailer didn't know who Jesus was. So the Bible says the very next verse, and they spake unto him the word of the Lord. They had to tell him who Jesus was. Now here's a man that's saying, well, you know, you, you don't know God, you don't know God. So here's what you do: is you pray to God, and you say, Lord, Lord Jesus. Well, how do they know? See what we're saying, friends? This half-truth, partial truth, selective truth, it's dangerous. It's dangerous. Now, he leads them on in a prayer, and they get a packet. You know, I'm, I'm sure, make sure we get your address so we can tithe and everything. And then listen to what he says here. Let's skip on down to verse, not verse, but time. my time count here. I'm going to tell your parents something. It happens fairly quickly. Last night, some little kids were crying because their parents took them out to go to the bathroom and they missed the fireworks. And so you need to think about that before you go. And uh, maybe don't feed them so much Coke or something. So uh, would you give Alan a great big hand? Come on, Alan. Dennis, thank you. Now, now remember, we're talking about boundaries here. Friends, where, where... In God's Word, we're talking about worshiping God. Do you get all the things that they're doing here on this particular occasion? They've been doing it all week. Now, where do they get this? See, now, if it's not in God's Word, you need to get over yourself. But here they are, pushing the boundaries. Oh, God has set boundaries for morality. And He, you know, He, he chastises men that don't know if they're men or not. Well, what about chastising people that don't know what God says to do when it comes to worshiping Him? I want you to listen to all of the utter chaos and, I don't know, 
blasphemy, I guess, that goes on. Yeah. Here I we are. make sure I turn back on. Holy yes. cow. To me, I would believe that we'd have to compare getting saved here today like winning a bull ride. Congratulations to all you Christians, new Christians. Are you ready to sit? All right. Being saved is like winning a bull riding. Yeah, it takes eight seconds and you're done, I guess. Need some more bull riding. Yeah. Now listen to what the clown said. I said, said are you ready to see some more bull riding? Are you ready to see Pastor Galen get on a bull? Y'all better pay off this building first. If someone writes a $19 million check to pay off the new building, I'll get on all the bulls that are here tonight. Oh, wow. Now, really? Now, friends, this is what I'm talking about. We're talking about pushing the envelope here. We're talking about pushing the boundaries of God. They were talking about selling their concessions to go and help mission work. Now, friends, think about this. They want you to buy popcorn and Coke and candy bars so they can send to do mission work and they're trying to pay off a 19 million dollar building a 19 million dollar building right now tell me friends is that not excess is that is that really the best use of the lord's money if they're if they're claiming to be the lord's church here as long as it takes. Come on, oh. get that checkbook out. If he's put a smile on your face, if you've been here multiple times this weekend, if he's made you forget about some kind of a little problem in life, how about a hand and make him welcome back your funny man, Showtime! Thank you, y'all are too kind. Who's ready to have some more fun on a Sunday morning? Come on! What is better than this? Bull riding and church all in one on a Sunday. Oh, bull riding in church, man. I tell you what, not, nothing better than that. Really, friends? See, now listen. Here's what we're talking about. Selective truth. There are boundaries in morality that, that God wants us to stick to, and if we don't, we're going to be in a mess. And the church is in a mess because we don't listen to what God says. And we get mad when people say this is what God says. All right. Well, are you going to get mad at me when I say, you know what? This is blasphemy to say I'm going to put a rodeo on in the middle of church. I'm going to go to church and have bull riding in the, in the church. Oh, yes, it's fun. Well, we're, you know, that, that's okay, I guess. So, no, it's selective. It's selective hearing. It's selective reading. Oh, yeah, yeah. All these, all these sinners out here, these fornicators and and homosexuals and druggies and whatever, boy, they're just ruining our society because they're just not being moral. And then turn around and do whatever they want to do in church. Bull riding and church on a Sunday morning. What's get better than that? Well, I'll tell you what's better than that. Bull riding in a race car <laughs> in church. I mean, let's just add something else, right? How about we have a wrestling ring? Hey, let's bring in the wrestling ring. Right? Can't we do that? I mean, where do you draw the line? Where does it stop? Number 12 in the world. He's number three in the rookie standings. He's got Kid Rock drawn. This is Logan Moore, Rickman, Tennessee. Logan Moore, more often than not, is going to ride him. That's why he's number 12 in the world. Here's a young man embarking on what we believe is going to be a stellar career in pro rodeo. He's number three in the rookie standings. Do me a favor. If All you... right, so we got the we got the rodeo going. Here, let's have a little more entertainment here. We got we got Elvis. We got the entertainment going here. We got the bull riding. We got the clowns. We got the uh, what the they had an auctioneer. They had an auction in there. They auctioned off a basket of goodies for four thousand dollars. 
and then and then we've got uh, they even had a cash scramble. I don't know if you ever seen a cash scramble or not. Oh, now y'all hear this song here? I'm, not, I'm gonna try not to play this song, all of this song. Well, you think this belongs in church? Well, yeah, the curse word right there. Curse word. Yeah, that's a rock concert, I guess. I don't know. God has boundaries in morality. We better quit, we better quit pushing the envelope there. Quit moving the boundaries. Because it'll really mess up our society. That, that's what really has got us going. That's what's got us going down the drain. But we don't we don't worry about the boundaries when it comes to worship God. We got bull riding. We got clowns. We got Elvis. We even got a rock concert going on here with curse words in it. Now, friends, do you see do you see the hypocrisy? Do you see the inconsistency? When a man says, when a man says we've got we've got problems and we got to quit pushing the boundary, then this is what goes on in his church. This is a worship service, supposedly. Really? All right, that's enough of that. Now, now, friends, I hope you see this is what we're talking about. Selective understanding, selective reasoning. Where people will say, well, yeah, you've got to obey the truth. And if you if you if you don't like what you hear when it's the truth, you just need to get over yourself. If God says do it, do it. God has boundaries for morality. We can't push those boundaries. We can't move those boundaries. Friends, can you please show me in the Bible where the New Testament church had a rock concert, where they had fireworks going off, where they had an entertainment going on, bull riding. I can just see, I can just see the, you know, the local uh, church in Rome there. Well, let's go down to the Colosseum. I think there's a good gladiator uh, bout going on. We'll have, we'll have gladiators for God, you know. I and mean, what, what, what are we doing here? Yeah, we'll run out the Colosseum. We'll have big sporting events, you know. We'll make sure there's plenty of popcorn and I don't know whatever they were eating and drinking in the early days. We'll make sure there's plenty of refreshments. We have a little sermon on there. Apostle Paul, he'll walk out. He'll do a little sermonette and tell people to raise their hand up. And then, in the very end, you know, we'll bring out the gladiators. Yeah, good blood sport there. Friends, this, is this really what we're coming to? Because no one wants to hear the truth. You know, he started off, Mr. Davis started off his sermon. He started off his sermon by talking about individuals having itching ears. Love won't do what grace I can't, I can't Nobody lie. needs to repent of their sin. He, he started off talking about itching ears. Friends, that's exactly what these people are doing. That's exactly what most of the religious world is doing. They don't want to hear Bible. They don't want to hear what God says to do when it comes to worship. They're, so, they're, they're content. They're content to say, don't push the boundaries unless, unless we can do what we want to do in worship. Selective hearing. Selective reasoning. Selective understanding. Friends, but the only thing that's profitable is the whole counsel of God. The whole truth. And your friends in the Church of Christ are the ones who will give you the whole truth. And if we can assist you in any way, we want to do that very thing. Thanks for watching. We're out of time. Till next time, always make sure you're getting a word from the Lord. Have a good night.